Good afternoon. My name is Tracy Banks, and I am president of the University Senate. Uh, and on behalf of the Faculty Senate and the Office of the Provost, I'd like to welcome all of you here today for uh, Dr. Gillespie's University Address as Provost. Uh, this is really a wonderful opportunity for us to come together as a community and really reflect on what unites all of us in this room, and that is a commitment to Wake Forest's academic mission. Um, while this is her first year as provost, uh, Dr. Gillespie has dedicated the past 24 years to serving our university and its academic mission. Uh, since 1999, when she joined the faculty as a member of the history department, she has gone on to serve as associate provost for academic initiatives before becoming dean of the college in 2015. And just nine months ago, she became Wake Forest's eighth provost. And this afternoon, Provost Gillespie will talk about her first year in this role and reflect on the state of higher education and share her thoughts on where we go from here. So please join me in welcoming Provost Gillespie. How are you all? Good. I'm glad you're here. As I walked over and I saw what an amazing day it was, I saw students on blankets out on the quad. I saw some people everywhere. And I thought, ah, I'm going to have five people in here. So it's really wonderful to see you all. Thank you so, so much, truly, for being here. It's an honor, a real, real honor, to serve as your provost at Wake Forest. And I do indeed appreciate the time you're taking to come to this address. As you can imagine, I gave this talk some thought. I asked myself, what does the Faculty Senate most hope to accomplish by asking the provost to give this annual address? I also thought hard about what the audience as a whole would most hope to hear, and I thought hard about what I hoped to accomplish with this time. And I have to say that left me a little bit uneasy. What if there were so many expectations out there that I left everyone in pew disappointed and no one showed up for the reception? Right? <laughs> wow, that would be a scenario I would absolutely not want to happen with my first provost address. <laughs> Actually, I suspect I share with the Faculty Senate and with all of you in this audience pretty much the same ambitions. We want this speech to invite the engagement we all appreciate having with each other. We want this address to underscore the importance of bringing the whole Wake Forest community together in regular and sustained dialogue as President Wente has invited us all to do since she arrived. So I wanna start at the beginning. What is the provost's job anyway? And what role can the provost play in facilitating a high level of engagement cooperation of collaboration on behalf of our mission across the university. Now out in the world beyond academe, I have to tell you, you probably know this already, no one has any idea whatsoever what a provost does. <laughs> if you ever need a conversation non-starter, just tell people you are a provost. <laughs> you know, when they ask you what you do and you say you're a provost, you get to enjoy the awkward silence that follows. <laughs> In fact, many people in university settings do not really know what a provost does either. And if I am honest with you, and if you know me, you know I'm always honest, probably too honest, despite my previous administrative work, it is only now, this nine months into this new role, that I'm beginning to really figure out to grasp the complexity and breadth of this role, especially at what I think is a very important moment in the history of this university under President Wente's exciting leadership. But what I can say with complete confidence is that engaging the university's academic community in regular and sustained dialogue is a critical part, and in many ways I would say it is the center of my new job. That's because the provost's job is to lead the academic mission of the university. Now that's not to say that President Wente is not committed to that job too. Of course she's committed to the academic mission. It is her responsibility to embrace it. And as you know, it's what President Wente is all about. But she also has other kinds of complex, weighty responsibilities on her plate that are critical to supporting our central mission. Whereas the academic mission is really my only responsibility. In this sense then, the provost can be described as the dean of deans. 
One of the most important duties of the provost is to facilitate interdisciplinary as well as cross-school collaboration at a time when the lines between fields and disciplines have become increasingly blurred and when we need multiple lenses and different kinds of knowledge to help us make sense of our highly complex world. The provost's role is also to nurture strong cooperative relationships among the deans who lead the faculty in their respective schools. And at Wake Forest, that means the College of Arts and Sciences, the Graduate School of Arts and Sciences, including biomedical sciences at the medical school, the School of Business, the School of Law, the Divinity School, the School of Professional Studies, and all with the support of the ZSR Library. The cooperation and collaboration of the deans is essential for reducing the barriers that make interdisciplinary and cross-school work possible, and for bringing equity and transparency to all our institutional expectations and supports. The dean's roles are essential for delivering on our academic mission. It's also the provost's responsibility to help ensure that the academic mission stays centered in the hearts and minds of all the vice presidents. Now, I will say we are fortunate at Wake Forest because this is not a difficult task. Our vice presidents are here at Wake because they believe in and want to act on behalf of our academic mission. They want to be partners. More than ever, I think the fundamental role of the provost is to be deeply involved with and supportive of faculty and academic affairs in respect to recruitment, hiring, and retention, in respect to diversity, equity, and inclusion in the curriculum and in the university structure itself, in respect to equitable workloads and salaries, in respect to shared governance, and of course, in support of excellence in teaching and research. But this faculty affairs work is always in collaboration with and support for the deans and governance within each school. It's also incumbent upon the provost to understand and champion the role of staff in delivering on our mission. Our staff are essential, can I underscore that? Essential in enabling academic excellence too, in our labs and our departments, in our clinics and programs, our centers and institutes, in our admissions office, financial aids office, uh, offices across all the schools, the registrar's offices, online education office, ORSP, OPCD, ODI, CLASS, CAT, OCCC, OCCE, in all the financial business, uh, financial business, IT, human resources, facilities, campus life, athletic, advancement, and the auxiliary functions of the university too. They are all here. They are all with us. Our staff make the work of faculty happen. They make the education that our students get happen. Our staff advise, they mentor, they instruct, they implement and they operationalize. They imagine and innovate. Together, these dedicated professionals make sure the faculty can do their very best work and be their very best selves for our students. Because of course, there is no academic mission without our extraordinary undergraduate, graduate, and professional students who value the top flight education we provide and who come to Wake Forest because of our genuine commitment to their learning and development, all in the name of Pro Humanitate. So in short, I believe my job is to nurture the intellectual life of the university to its fullest by engaging and supporting our community of faculty, staff, and students. I want to ensure that Wake Forest has the resources and strategic vision so our faculty can be excellent teacher scholars and lead path-breaking research, scholarship, and creative work across disciplines and schools. Above all, I want to ensure that the university's academic mission, its educational and research purposes, serve our graduates and all our alumni for their lifetimes and serve broader communities at home and around the globe. These are the values I think the provost, me right now, must embrace and must help the entire Wake Forest community to implement. One of our first acts last fall as a newly reconstituted provost office team was to build consensus around our sense of mission out of that office. Here's what the provost office determined was our charge. Here's our slide here. The mission, well, you can read it yourself. So my first ask of all of you today is to consider where do you think I've got my job right and whether the provost office has got its mission right on your and the university's behalf. Now, I'm not going to stop my talk right now to take your answers, okay? <laughs> but I am going to invite you to share your thoughts with me, whether it's at the reception right after the talk 
or by emailing my office or whenever our paths cross in the next few days and weeks. <laughs> even better, or perhaps even better, depending on your preference, at the very end of this talk, there's going to be a QR code that will take you to, your, to a form and you can provide feedback right away, as much as you want, as little as you want with that code. Now, I hope I, uh, it's no surprise to you that I've spent much of these first nearly nine months listening. I've listened to my new staff. I've listened to our junior faculty colleagues from across all the schools over really wonderful lunches in the Heritage Room. I've listened to faculty and staff at feedback sessions for strategic framing across the fall and into the spring. I've listened to faculty, staff, and students share their hopes and aspirations for the next dean of the college, the next dean of the law school, and the next dean of the Divinity School. I've listened to the University Faculty Senate and the Senate Executive Committee. I've listened in lots of one-on-one -on -one meetings, meetings with many of you as I look around in this room. That listening has been so important. It may be the most important thing I've accomplished this first year. I want to share with you some of the things that I've heard. Across all the schools, I've heard that we believe deeply and seek to carry out the teacher-scholar ideal. In all honesty, I have to say, I did not understand how important this ideal was to those schools all of those schools beyond the college. I was college-centric until this year. And that commitment in all our schools is impressive and praiseworthy. And it makes our professional and graduate education quite spectacular. We may not all define teacher-scholar in quite the same way. We may have doubts about our ability to, to deliver on the ideal equally well at all stages of our career. We may, may not be as clear as we'd like about what the teacher-scholar ideal means for our faculty on all our different appointment tracks. But we see this ideal as central to our academic mission and distinctive to our Wake Forest identity. We are all agreed across all the schools and the university that we are profoundly student-centered, that faculty play a powerful, meaningful role, not only in teaching, but in mentoring our students, and that staff play a critical role in that work too. I heard that we all believe deeply in our motto of pro humanitate, and this belief drives the work we all do at Wake Forest and gives it true purpose. This belief undergirds how we approach our work, which is in a deeply relational, humanistic, and purposeful way. I also heard, over and over again, a strong desire to deliver even better on our aspirations for academic excellence, for access and opportunity, for being leaders in higher education, for outstanding research and scholarship and creative work, for making a difference in our local and global communities. And I heard that we are committed to and value diversity, equity, inclusion in all that we do, recognizing that we've been making some good steps forward, but that we have many more big steps to take and that this critical work is never done. To that latter point, I also heard what we need to do better to more fully deliver on our shared ambitions. I heard about the importance of academic space. How can we structure and allocate it better to provide stronger support for so much of what we want to do? We're fortunate that President Wente has identified supporting our academic space priorities as one of her top priorities, and I'll speak more about this in a few minutes. I heard about the need to better support experiential learning in all our schools, be it student research, community work, clinical work, internships. We need a stronger infrastructure to facilitate this critical component of transformative learning. I heard that we can do better at applying and using technology to more fully modernize and integrate our academic work. I heard loud and clear that you champion President Wente's clarion call for radical collaboration. You have told me we must double down on generating much more coordination and facilitating far more collaboration everywhere we turn, within and across our schools and the university, in academics and in how we administer and support academics. And you have told me that the provost must lead in removing the barriers that impede this integration and cooperation. And you told me that you will help me, because of course we can't not make collaborative work happen only from the top down. We have to dig in and work together. We know it will be messy and challenging and frustrating at times, but worth the mutual respect, transparency, and commitment we all bring to the table to do it together. And now I have another question for you to think about. What didn't I hear? What did I miss? Again, I'm not gonna stop my talk right now, but you're gonna have an opportunity at the reception or afterwards or with the QR code to tell me. 
I know, I want to say to you, please know that I want to know. I see that as my job. I've been in academics a long time, and higher ed has consistently been in the headlines all across my professional life. But I've never been more conscious of public opinion and the politicization of what we do than in my first year as provost. It's a tough time. It's a tough time for colleges and universities, once lauded, and I still think they should be, for being the best higher education in the world, the best higher education system in the world. So let's look at some of our current challenges. Sadly, the majority of Americans now doubt higher ed's ability to protect and enhance democracy. Moreover, two-thirds of Americans on both sides of the political spectrum believe that inadequate financial aid and student debt are serious problems in higher education that limit students' opportunity to attend college. And I know we understand that too. Then there's the governor of Florida. He's bringing a sweeping bill, HB 999, to the state's legislator any day now, legislature any day now that would defund diversity, equi equity, and inclusion efforts at state institutions, concentrate hiring power in the hands of trustees, and eliminate majors in certain subjects focused on race and gender. Other state legislatures, especially in southern states, are pursuing similar limitations on public institutions. Then we need to think about what will happen. Later this spring, the US Supreme Court will be delivering a decision on affirmative action. The ability to consider a student's race, along with a wide range of other factors in admissions decisions. Despite strong briefs supporting the practice, it is expected that affirmative action will be overturned. Schools across the country will have to determine the immediate impact of the decision on their own admissions practices, on financial aid and recruitment programs, and we will all have to work through the long-term impact. As profoundly challenging as all these issues are, I'm actually very confident that we at Wake Forest can and are handling them and will handle them well. In fact, while these may be truly tough times in higher ed, Wake Forest, by many measures, is thriving. Why? Why are we thriving in these times? Well, first of all, we share powerful core values. Our commitment to pro-humanitate, for example, means we embrace the notion that a college education helps sustain a healthy democracy. Our very embrace of the power of a liberal arts education signals that commitment as does the teaching and scholarship of all our faculty across the campus. And that includes in politics and international affairs, in the law school, in our Washington program, in our longstanding use of deliberative dialogue, in the Law Review's per Preserving Democracy Symposium, in the Deeks Decide Voter Engagement Program, the list goes on and on. We take seriously our commitment to sending informed, engaged graduates out into the world to practice and protect democracy. And while we all know tuition costs are high, because the costs of providing a truly outstanding educational experience for all our students continue to rise, President Wente has made raising scholarship funds to make Wake Forest more affordable for more students her top priority and ours. In our politics, law, sociology, education, anthropology, African American studies and history courses, and really across so much of our curricula, in the papers and the articles and the books we publish, in our centers and our symposia and workshops, we are documenting past and current inequitable constructions of power that lie at the heart of American politics, culture, society, and economic systems. And we are sharing this work with the world. And we are thinking through, thanks to the leadership of our Vice President for Admissions and our legal counsel, ways to sustain our commitment to building diverse entering classes year in and year out, regardless of the Supreme Court decision that will be delivered later this spring. There is a 1989 lithograph that now hangs in the office of the provost. It's by the artist Barbara Kruger. It's titled Savoir si pouvoir, Knowledge is Power. I love this piece because it reminds me every single day of what we are accomplishing at Wake Forest and why we do what we do. Each of us is committed to giving every single Wake Forest student the knowledge and understanding they need to make sense of the challenges we are encountering right now, but also the challenges they will be encountering across their lifetimes. Whether our students are taking courses in chemistry or management, psychology or theological studies, journalism or biotechnology, we teach them 
how to ask the probing questions, how to reason, how to be careful evidence, uh, how to make careful evidence-based arguments, and how to engage with any and all viewpoints. We seek to give our students a base of knowledge about themselves and the wider world, along with a liberal arts-based way of thinking that will empower them personally and professionally as citizens and human beings for their entire lives. The vitality of this university is remarkable, and I feel very privileged to be in a position now where I really can see it. Every day, faculty offer hundreds of courses to thousands of students, mostly in person here on Rinalda, but also at Wake Downtown, at Brookstown, in Charlotte, at the Medical School, at Wake Washington, in Casa Artem, in Flow House, in Whirl House, and in Salamanca, Dijon, and Santiago. And virtually, too, to students around the country and the globe. Think of our counseling MA, our School for Professional Studies, our Master's in Sustainability, our Master's in Business Analytics and Administration, and our MA in Law. We have world-class teachers who make ideas and knowledge come alive. These same faculty members are world-class scholars and researchers. Our faculty are authors of impressive books. I have, so let's just take a look at some of our recent titles. I'm going to take a drink of water while you look at those great titles. <laughs> One of the funnest things that I've been able to do um, as a new provost is to give the, uh, the board of trustee members of our academic committee your books. We give them the books for Christmas. It's just a treat. And they love them. And they're so proud of it. And they love these books. I also want to share that our faculty and staff have secured impressive gifts some 55 this academic uh, grants, some 55 this academic year so far, in 17 college departments and across all the schools. So take a look at this fantastic, uh, at these fantastic foundations and granting agencies that are supporting our Wake Forest scholars. In addition to outstanding teachers and research, our faculty and staff produce a rich, vibrant intellectual and cultural life across this campus and into the community. We host scores of terrific speakers and events. Our arts community offerings are magnificent. Our Wake the Arts initiative is powerful. And we have spectacular conferences across the entire year. In fact, I'm going to give a quick plug for tomorrow's Center for Research Engagement Collaboration in African American Life Symposium, or a Life Symposium. This, this symposium entitled Of Hearth and Table Culture, Cultivation, and Food Access in Black Communities, coming tomorrow. Our academic offices support all this terrific work and are vital centers of innovation in, them, in and of themselves. For example, the Center for the Advancement of Teaching, which is celebrating its 25th anniversary tomorrow, and the Instructional Technology Group are offering a series of workshops and seminars to explore chat PT, GPT as a teaching tool. Wake Forest's new interactive fact book, produced by the Office of Institutional Research, contains multiple years of the most recent student, faculty, and staff data, as well as other university data available to us all. The Affinity Resources group, Resource Group, sponsored by ODI, provides powerful community building opportunities. The class office was featured in this week's Inside Higher Ed for its student-facing problem solving. I'm just scratching the surface here in regard to all these exciting and invaluable commitments and support offices and community building offices, but they all work, we all work together to make Wake Forest even better. So given all of this excellence, where are we headed? What do we do? to be better. I see my office as being essential in helping make inclusive excellence integral to everything we do at Wake Forest for the well-being of our entire community. We must understand our institutional roots and recover and reckon more fully with that complex past, our complex past. To that end, I've been honored to co-chair with Derek Hicks the Slavery, Race, and Memory Project this past year. The group has had two rich retreats in which we assessed the powerful impact of past SRMP work and marked out where we need to be headed, and especially the ways we can better guide the research, preservation, and communica uh, communication of the history of this institution in respect to slavery, race, and racism. The provost office must help all our schools offer robust and representative curricula and programs, enroll diverse students and recruit, hire, and retain diverse faculty and staff 
to ensure we're delivering on our pro-humanitate and preparing our students and this community to be citizens and leaders in our profoundly diverse world across race, ethnicity, gender, identity, religion, politics, and life experiences. The provost's office needs to build new and deepen existing interdisciplinary connections, opportunities, and structures, and facilitate the creation of exceptional university-wide collaborations to better leverage our resources across schools. We must systematically tackle the barriers to this work, and we are beginning to do so, and we will. We've made some really important headway this year with, for example, a cross-school bioethics conversation last fall and now a sustained cross-school effort to build out our commitment to neuroscience in pursuit of a grant for a cross-school neuroscience and society center. This is an area where we have tremendous interdisciplinary depth and reach and lends itself to our medical school connections. We need to strengthen scholarship, creative work, and research while continuing to support exceptional teaching. Huron Consulting is assessing ways to strengthen our Office of Research and Sponsored Programs and we are reviewing all our funding resources in the provost's office as I speak. To that end, we'll be increasing the provost faculty travel fund from $1,000 to $2,000 a year beginning July 1st. In our pledge to be more transparent, the provost's office needs to share more knowledge about how the university works beyond academics. And to this end, we will be holding a How Wake Forest workshop in early May. And this is modeled after our very successful How Wake Forest Works workshop that we did for our uh, working groups, our strategic framing working groups in January. But we want this to be for all faculty, interested faculty and staff, as a place to share essential university knowledge about key topics like advancement, finances, diversity and inclusion, community partnerships, and institutional research. And we recently received an endowed gift to fund a leadership development program out of the provost office to support more academics in exploring administrative roles. Meanwhile, we just welcomed back to campus six great faculty leaders from law, divinity, the graduate school, ZSR library, and the college who spent three days at the highly effective ACC leadership program, a year-long workshop committed to nurturing the next generation of chairs, directors, assistant and associate deans, associate provosts, and future provosts and presidents. This is a year of transition and cultivating new leadership across our schools. I have to say, I could not be more beholden to our current deans. They have been mighty leaders across this year, and we have come together to create important new shared processes on everything from a new way to review academic programs, new academic programs, to choosing commencement speakers and honorary degree holders. Meanwhile, we have launched Dean Searches, and as you know, just announced the appointment of Jackie Crassus as our new Dean of the College and Graduate School last week. This is a wholly new role based on critical faculty feedback that rightly pressed for more substantive alignment and integration of the undergraduate and graduate programs. The new Law Dean Search is underway right now, and we're very pleased with the high, high quality of the candidates and I'm working very closely with the discernment committee in the Divinity School to plan our next steps for appointing that school's next dean. Interim deans Tony Marsh, Nell Newton, and Corey Walker are all a joy to work with, carrying out these difficult posts with Elan. Annette Ramped has had a strong first year in the business school. Veteran deans Charles Iacovu, Brad Jones, Dwayne Godwin, and Tim Pyatt have offered key support. Please remember to thank them let them know how much you appreciate your dedica their dedication. And now I want to close my address this afternoon with a status report. A status report on three hot topics that affect us all. Space, strategic framing, and shared governance. So let's start with space. I think we all know that space matters. Academic space matters. It matters greatly. We all know that particular parts of our campus our space challenged, shall we say. President Wente has in fact made space needs and space allocation a top priority of her presidency. And if you haven't read her February 2nd blog from Wente's desk, I urge you to do so tonight. She has signaled her commitment to this critical challenge with the creation of the University Space Planning Group, which I co-chair with Hoff Milam. That work is, set, um, is shaped by a set of guiding principles that prioritize academic space. And you will recall that we engaged uh, the Smith Group last year, charging them with assessing current and future space needs on the Rinalda campus, as well as the capacity of our peripheral campus properties to meet future needs. 
last fall, the Smith Group reported that while we had adequate space for the university as a whole, the challenge was in its uneven allocation. As we all know, COVID changed where and how many employees work, fundamentally altering the occupancy, at least in, in relationship to Wake Forest, of adjacent campus real estate. Think here about 2400 Rinalda and the University Corporate Center, better known as the UCC. This past year, a full 434,000 square feet became vacant in these two buildings combined as major tenants and their rent payments went away. <laughs> This shifting landscape compelled us to rethink the proposed academic commons building plans, which had been designed with only 60,000 square feet of new usable square footage on campus before COVID, and four years later was clearly no longer going to meet our needs. It also was going to cost significantly more than we had originally planned. So we are now carefully pondering some major directional decisions to meet our more clearly defined current and future space challenges. We are considering how to use the ample UCC space where finance and IS are, are currently housed to free up much needed space on the core campus. We've brought in Air St. Gross, experts in campus uh, space management to work through our options with us, both for relocation possibilities and for optimal use of future vacated space on the core Rinalda campus. Air St. Gross will update the board on its progress at the April meeting. We've worked closely with faculty and staff representatives on the USPG and consulted with the University Priorities Group and the Senate Executive Committee in doing this important research and assessment work, and we will keep you updated. Our goal, of course, is a comprehensive space plan. No more reacting to a sudden challenge with no big picture in mind, and we all know this is an important new direction for Wake. Now I'm gonna to turn to strategic framing. This past year, President Wente charged the university with developing a clear vision and direction to further support our mission in the form of a strategic framing process. It is intended to guide our strategic work on our shared journey to 2034, our 200th anniversary. It's our expectation that this process will deepen and sustain our greatness as a university into our third century. We get, began this work by asking literally thousands of Wake Foresters, faculty, staff, students, uh, trustees, alumni, to share their perspective on what makes Wake Forest a distinctive uh, uh, in the higher ed landscape. The shared consensus reply from across these constituencies was resoundingly the same. Embodying pro humanitate, embracing the teacher-scholar ideal, providing a holistic, mentored educational experience were all what made Wake Forest stand out that's what we heard from our stakeholders. The core planning team, composed of almost all faculty from across the university, then engaged in an iterative process, collecting feedback from the broader community all along the way. And that resulted in a set of five key areas for focus work that we turned into working groups. These working groups, which reflect cross-campus representation, including the medical school, DEI, and Senate, rep Senate representation, have spent the last two and a half months working very hard assessing, discussing, and formulating key objectives on student experience, teaching and learning, research and scholarship, community well-being, and partnerships. Each of the working groups just completed a draft concept paper last week with high-level uh, recommendations. And if you know anyone, and I know we have some members of the working group here in this working groups here in this room, please give them their kudos. They did an amazing job. Um, we're great, very grateful to them for their excellent efforts. The groups will be revising their papers with the intention of submitting their final version at the end of the semester. These concept papers will form the core of the strategic framework, which will be shared with the board and the whole community this summer, and will result in task forces to assess and implement top priority recommendations, and also in school and unit-specific strategic framing over the next academic year. Although this important work has been demanding and time constrained, the process, the process, and I said trust in the process, has worked really well. The results thus far are exciting and we look forward to being able to share them with all of you. Now let's turn to governance. Shared governance is a cornerstone of American higher education. In fact, it's been recognized by some and I think this may be debatable, but I'll just say this, as the second, long, second longest standing system of institutional shared governance in the world, second only to 
the church. Shared governance in American colleges and universities had been, it's been around for more than a century, and its principles and best practices for ensuring the faculty have voice in university policymaking were articulated as early as 1920 by the American Association of University Professors, when the AAUP published its first statement on shared governance between faculty, administrators, and trustees. As a faculty member, I've long been a strong advocate for governance many, many years. I've been an AAUP member, and I was elected to the Senate twice. It's from this experience that I've reflected a great deal on the ways we can strengthen this fundamental relationship between faculty, administration, and the board. I think we've made good progress this past year. Administration has sought Senate advice on faculty representation for all our senior searches. Not surprisingly, these Senate nominees have proven to be wise colleagues and strong recruiters in this work. Senators have served across each stage of the strategic framing process, as I mentioned, both on the core planning team and on each of the five working groups. And the very process of strategic framing has been faculty-led, inclusive, and iterative. I'm delighted we've worked together to standardize how we document faculty handbook changes, and I'm glad we're bringing the faculty handbook into the provost office beginning July 1st. We do have significantly more work ahead, though, work that will take several years in all likelihood on handbook updates and revisions. But this is critical work, work that must be done well, and it must be done together. Shared governance takes time. You may recall that our former provost created an extensive task force two years ago that included subject matter experts and faculty and staff representation to draft a discrimination and harassment policy based on federal guidance, best practices at peer institutions, and input from the Faculty Senate and the Staff Advisory Council. That, that policy is almost ready to unveil to the whole community. This process will be managed from a new office, Office of Institutional Equity, which will report to the Executive Vice President, Vice Provost, excuse me. No, the Executive Vice President, I caught, I caught myself, I'm just trying to you know, gather everything all around in the... In the. <laughs> Don't empire build, Michelle, no. Okay. <laughs> it will report to the executive vice president. We are finalizing our recommendations to take to the board of trustees for review at their April meeting. We believe that discrimination and harassment policy and the new office of institutional equity reflect the priorities and commitment that our, our community already embraces while creating additional structure to uh, set up more consistent experiences and to protect each member of our community. It's my hope that faculty, staff, Senate, provost, and president continue building out these kinds of mutually respectful partnerships, best manifested in strong communication, always ensuring that the academic and policy changes we make reflect good process, including ample consultation, advice, and feedback. It's also my hope going forward that we all see this moment this moment as the ideal time for a reaffirmation of shared governance, a reanimation of this unique and powerful model for assessing intellectual, accessing intellectual resources, and a reframing of our shared commitments to institutional progress and sustainability. I want to close my remarks by referencing President Wente's terrific mantra of trust, transparency, and teamwork, because I believe fully in those three T's. And in doing so, I want to make an ask of you at this time. I ask you to cultivate trust, trust in each other and trust in the process. My role is to build good academic processes and healthy relationships, and trust, transparency, and teamwork is the only way to do that. I want to increase academic communication across the university, and I invite your ideas on how to do that better. We all need to work together to respect the systems we have created and reform and repair them when they do not meet our shared values and aspirations. This work is ongoing, it's never ending, because we will always want to make force, make force better for all our students, for our community, and for each other. I'm gonna tell you, we're not gonna agree all the time, and it's good, I think it's really good to have healthy, respectful debate. We will, in the end, have to make hard decisions, especially around our priorities and our resource allocations, but those decisions must be well considered, they must be well informed, and they must be clearly explained. And that's my final pledge to you this afternoon, to work really hard to do just that. Now, I want to thank you for all your attention, and I think it's time for the President of the Senate, Tracy Banks, who's been a wonderful leader of the Senate, to ask me some important questions.
These are great questions, um, and that is become because these are the questions that um, we were able to sort of distill from all of the feedback that we got in the survey that we sent out. So thank you so much to everyone who participated, who sent something in. We had three large themes emerge um, from the questions that came, and we've sort of distilled them down into questions that I will ask Provost Gillespie, two of them now. Um, the first one is on salary and inflation. I know that's a shock for you to hear. Um, <laughs> how is the university planning to respond to the problem of low raise rates, typically around 2.5%, in the face of high inflation rates, around 7% in 2022, and about 6% in 2023, and a 75% increase in housing costs in Winston-Salem between 2018 and 2023? Thank you, Tracy, and thank everyone who submitted questions so that we could have, uh, so I could give you some feedback about this. May I also ask the other one? I messed up. We, There's well, two at once. Do you want to take them one at a time? Then we do operations after that. You want to do that we after? do morale. Yeah, let's do them oh. one at a time. All right. Okay, that's great. And I, I want to, in full disclosure, this is not the first time. Tracy sent me these questions yesterday, <laughs> okay? So it's not like when I give you sort of answer, you know, full flight answers, I'm not, you know, they're not coming full sprung out of my head in this moment. Uh, you'd be really impressed if they, if they did, but that's not my forte. Um, so the bottom line, we are in very challenging times. This is a particularly challenging time across this, call, uh, across this country and around the world. Um, and there are certain realities about how we as an institution work. Our raise pools are in fact merit-based. They're not linked to cost of living. We do make periodic market assessments. Our deans check faculty salaries against benchmark data in their fields and disciplines every year, year in and year out. Human Resources also provides market data for all of our staff positions in the same way. And I'm sure everyone is aware that we have made market adjustments with minimum wage increases uh, just this year and in past years as well. When we talk about the realities, let me give you some. The reality at Wake Forest is that our budget is 80% tuition dependent from re for revenue. And then we are 67% or well, 67% of our total expenses at Wake Forest are our salaries. To maintain our financial solvency and meet our financial aid needs, our tuition increases have to be a half to 1% higher than our merit pool increase. This financial model means we have a real tension between wanting to raise our merit pool percentage for our faculty and staff and working very hard to limit our tuition increases on behalf of our students. Of course, we can always resort to other recourses. Alternatively, we could eliminate expenses or programs or departments or reallocate funding. The good news, the really good news in all of this is that we are in a very solid financial position, unlike so many other colleges and universities around the country. However, we're very aware, we do recognize the pressures that inflation is causing everyone and our, across our whole country. And this is something that the cabinet talks about all the time, all the time. How do, we, uh, how do we deal with these challenges? How do we find this balance within the constraints that are reflected by our own university? So. The second set of questions was around operations and um, Specifically, we'd like to ask, while some buildings and roads have been renamed, Waite Chapel has not, despite Samuel Waite's ownership of enslaved people. Will you give us a timeline of when Waite Chapel will be renamed, perhaps to Wake Chapel? Are there other remaining renaming, excuse me, or memorial activities planned? Yeah. Again, thank you for this question. Um, I think you all know I'm a historian of the American South. And uh, I've taught a research uh, course, a capstone research course on memory and history, and I've written on the subject too. So this is a place where I really get to rely on my own academic expertise to shape how I approach these questions as um, Wake Forest's newest provost. So this is expertise, in fact, is why I wanted to co-lead the Slavery, Race, and Memory Project. So in regard to naming or renaming campus buildings and exterior spaces, this decision making falls under the purview of the University Board of Trustees per the bylaws. So this is their area. 
I want to take you back almost two years, back to May of 2021. At that time, President Hatch announced the decision to rename Wingate Hall and to keep the name of Waite Chapel. At that time, he also announced the board's resolution to build a campus memorial. The proposed memorial is intended both to honor and remember the lives of the men and women inextricably connected to our institutional history as enslaved persons and to contextualize Wake Forest College's founder and first president, Samuel Waite, and therefore tell a more honest, uh, more a whole history of our past through this memorialization work, both about Waite and Wake Forest. Under Dr. Wente's leadership last year, we began to take important steps toward, uh, toward these desired outcomes. We held forums across the campus to solicit input and feedback about how the university honors and remembers its history. The name Wingate Hall was removed and replaced with a wayfinding name, the Divinity and Religious Studies Building. We began the work of identifying a design firm to guide the university's development of a campus memorial to honor the enslaved men and women we've documented and the, those we were to come. And we developed and piloted a process for honorific naming to ensure we consistently and appropriately manage honorific naming opportunities when they arise. Prior to last year, there was no formal process in place for the university to recommend an honorific name to the board for consideration. Now, when an honorific uh, naming opportunity arises, the president convenes an ad hoc committee of faculty and administrative leaders with expertise concerning the naming inquiry. That group gathers feedback and input from community stakeholder groups. The road naming inquiry last year included feedback solicited from the faculty senate executive committee, among other groups, all before a recommendation is made to the president for the naming opportunity. Meanwhile, the university has identified an architecture and design partner to work with us on this memorialization project. The project will take place over the next academic year and will result in a proposed memorial design informed by intentional community engagement. I am delighted to share that I'm going to get to co-chair that effort. Um, <laughs> Please note that Dr. Wente will be providing more context and details about our next steps in the coming months. Using my history expertise. Ah. <laughs> All right, and the final question um, is on morale and lack of community. Um, faculty morale seems to be at an all-time low. Colleagues seem disrespectful to each other trust between faculty and between faculty and administration is a real problem. How does the provost's office plan to address these serious concerns in the operation of Wake Forest University? Thank you, Tracy. Um, I wanted to end with this question because it's a question that's deeply, deeply, deeply disheartening and concerning to me. I've been an academic for a really long time and tension between faculty and administration I mean, has always been around. But faculty disrespecting each other, faculty not trusting each other, is a newer challenge and one that I'm very sad to hear about. So I want to ask you, and this is part of the ask that we'll give you at the end, is this your experience? How widespread is this sentiment? In general, these layers of distrust have not been my experience this year. In my conversations with faculty in our lunches and at campus events and in the searches and in committees and certainly across strategic framing, I've experienced nothing but faculty enthusiasm, optimism, and excitement about what, what faculty are doing and about Wake's bright future. So I do want to know more about this level of distress and these acts of disrespect. Certainly, as I mentioned earlier, these are rocky times in academe. The Chronicle and Inside Higher Ed are full of awful stories, and higher ed is being used as polarizing political fodder at the local, state, and national levels these days. The pressures we all feel from society about what we do are real, and they are undermining, and they can be divisive. We're also in the midst of lots of transitions here at Wake, as President Wente has referenced in her addresses and blogs. We're bringing in lots of new leadership, and this creates uncertainty and worry. We're also seeing big demographic changes as beloved senior faculty retire and we hire terrific young teacher scholars. These micro and macro experiences are all framed by living through one of the strangest and scariest periods in American history. 
a worldwide pandemic in which people isolated themselves for very long periods of time. Coming out of COVID has been hard for all of our society, and campuses across the country are seeing increased needs for mental health and well being resources. At the same time, I've been struck by the joy and the enthusiasm faculty have expressed to me about being able to be together again. Yes, they have pointed it out it can be work to have to literally rebuild relationships with old colleagues and build relationships with our newest ones, but it's worthwhile, meaningful work, they tell me. It is the work that lies at the very heart of collegiality and community. The need for trust work is not unique to Wake Forest. Higher ed is full of thought pieces and essays on the need to rekindle trust across academe. And certainly rebuilding our communities takes real time and real commitment. Everyone needs to do it. Everyone needs to be a part of community building. Everyone needs to show up. Everyone needs to re-engage. There are ways administration can facilitate this rebuilding and help transcend these trust issues. We can hold more cross-school faculty gatherings where faculty can share best practices or lessons learned. We can do things like organizing small group walk and talks where faculty and staff can come together with colleagues from different disciplines and offices from across different generations and just share ideas and experiences walking the Rinalda trails. Know that I always welcome your suggestions. Of course, this rebuilding work needs to start at a very local level. It starts with being present, literally being present, with being here at Wake Forest, and then with reaching out to our colleagues in the office next to us, with our colleagues on our floor in our departments and buildings, and then at the school level. It begins with reaching out to younger colleagues and supporting them. It begins with celebrating each other's successes. It begins with showing up for each other's events, and it begins with giving each other grace and respecting each other's humanity at a time when our society as a whole is having a hard time doing just that. I want to be honest with you. Long before I went into administration, something I actually had never expected to do, I was a faculty member who sometimes felt that gap between faculty and administration and who sometimes did not understand university decision making. In fact, there were plenty of times when I felt alienated, when I felt angry, when I felt disaffected. Eventually, eventually, rather than sitting on the sidelines and grousing and throwing pot shots, I began to engage in more college-wide and university service, including in the Senate, as I mentioned earlier. In these new places, I was able to share my sensibilities and experiences. Sometimes they were useful, and sometimes they were not. <laughs> and at the same time, I began to learn more about how the university worked and how I could add value. My decision to do administrative work comes out of these sets of experiences, including the true pleasure I take in working cooperatively and collaboratively with faculty, staff, administrators, the board, and students to help bring about the change we want to see. This work has been one of the joys of my professional career. So in short, this is my invitation to you to take on that committee nomination, to come to that feedback session, to attend faculty and Senate meetings, knowing that this is the way that each of us makes our voice heard, each of us makes our voice matters, each of us finds the way to make a difference. Now that I'm provost, I wanna to continue to bring my lived experience to bear in our work together. I want you to bring your lived experience to the table too. I want my faculty colleagues and my staff colleagues to, con to, to continue to trust me to share your concerns and your work with me so that we can find the solutions together. And I want you to do that with the vice presidents and the president. Now that's really the last question because it's time to go and head to the reception. So I wanna thank Tracy very much for this opportunity. Uh, you have been a wonderful, wonderful president. You've been a wonderful leader of the Senate. I wanna thank the senators for their partnership. And I thank you, wanna thank all of you, all of you in this audience for being here for your commitment and engagement. Now we got the QR code up here, so you can send me your questions and comments directly. Know that I plan on using a monthly letter to help me answer more future queries. And now, please join me for our reception out in the courtyard on this beautiful, beautiful Thursday afternoon. Thank you.